Okay. Um, so the exam was scheduled for next Friday, the 6th um, of November. So it's going to be kind of a similar format as last time where we're going to have kind of a two day block. Uh, I'm toying around with the idea of maybe extending it kind of where you could take it over the weekend. Uh, I don't want to expect that, but it would give us kind of a day on Friday where we could do even more review. Um, I will probably, one of the questions in, in the uh, online quiz today will be if you would rather have it so kind of the days that it's open is Thursday, Friday, um, or if you'd rather have it so that it's open kind of Friday through kind of the end of the weekend. Uh, that'll be one of the questions and I'll kind of see kind of, kind of what the general consensus of the class is. Um, I don't want to expect you to kind of do things over the weekend, but at the same time, giving you that extra day of kind of reviewing class Friday, but then not kind of expecting you to, you know, have to be able to complete it by the end of the day on Friday and have it, you know, left open over the weekend. I can see advantages to, to both, right, as a, as a student. So I'll, I'll be one of the questions today and we'll talk a little bit more about kind of what the results look like uh, next class. I'll probably set it so that uh, the quiz has to be submitted like an hour early so I can look at it prior to, to class on Wednesday. Um, just so I can kind of review kind of what the answer to that question is. Or maybe I'll just, you know what, no, I won't make part of the quiz. I'll just put it as a separate poll. That way, just get on there today and answer that question. That way I'll have kind of your response um, and be able to talk about it Wednesday. So just get on, I'll put a poll up, answer it prior to, to you know, noon on Wednesday. If you don't, I guess you won't uh, be, be one of the ones where I'm, I'm taking your preference into consideration. So it's up to you. If you really have a strong preference, get on and um, answer that poll today. So really what we, we have is we have one more type of hypothesis testing example we're going to talk about, and we're going to do that today. And then we're going to have some two population hypothesis testing and confidence interval stuff. We'll probably be able to go through it a little bit quicker because we already have really the fundamentals down. So Wednesday, Friday, next Monday, we'll go over that two population stuff. And then Wednesday and Friday of next week, we'll be able to do some, some review. I'll get the practice exams up there after class today. Uh, some of the last few questions obviously will be things that we haven't haven't done because we've got three more class periods of material, but you can at least start taking a look at those if you want to. Um, and once again, they'll look pretty similar to kind of this types of questions you'll see on that second exam. Any questions for me before we get kind of jumping in material here? Let me make sure and see if there's anything on the uh, chat. Okay. So we left off kind of finishing up some Excel examples for sample means when we knew the population variance or knew the population standard deviation proportion examples. Today we're gonna to go through by hand some examples where we are looking at a sample mean. So we wanna know where the true population mean is, but we only have a sample variance. We don't have a known population variance, which is the more realistic setting. I mean, it's just almost all the time we're not gonna know the population variance. and so. We'll work through some examples and then we'll kind of jump into Excel to see how we would do it in Excel. So just kind of a reminder, if we're going to perform a hypothesis test, the first thing we have to do, identify that null alternative hypothesis. We're going to have some level of alpha we want to test, you know, test at. Uh, we can test at multiple levels, but, you know, we, we usually look at the same three alphas, 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01. We'll calculate a test statistic or a Z statistic using that test statistic, find a p-value. That looks a little different if we're doing a left, right, or two-tailed test, which is why the very first step is identify which of those tests we have. And then compare that p-value to our alpha. If it's less than alpha, we reject. If not, we fail to reject. We said we could do the critical value approach. Things look very similar there. First two steps are identical. Really, the, the third one's the same too. We're calculating that test statistic. The fourth step's a little different. That's where we're gonna find our critical value and our rejection region. And then instead of comparing the p-value to alpha, we compare that test statistic or that z statistic to, is it in that rejection region? Or we're comparing it to that critical value. Really. Is it more extreme or larger in absolute value than that, that critical value we found? So that's just kind of a review of the, the steps that we'll take. Here's some slides for what we kind of done in Excel that kind of match the, the examples. Today, we'll be going over this one, all right? But these are just kind of summary slides in there. If, you, if you're going back and looking at the Excel example we worked through, here's kind of more of a summary, right? Probably easier to look at it in Excel, but 
So when we have an example where we have a sample mean, but we don't know the population variance, but we looked at confidence intervals, right, for, for these, what was the main thing that changed? With confidence intervals, when we only had a sample variance, we had to use the not standard normal distribution, but the student T distributions, right, or those T tables, right? So it's the same kind of thing is going to apply here. Because when we go to calculate our test statistic, oops, we're no longer going to have a population variance. We're only going to have a sample variance. Now, other than that, the test statistic equation hasn't changed at all, right? This denominator now, right, it represents the standard deviation of our sample means. But because we're using a sample variance, it's going to be a little bit, a little bit different than if we had the population variance. So when we calculate this statistic, it's not coming from a standard normal distribution. So it's not a Z statistic anymore. It's coming from a student T distribution. So I'll start kind of referring to that as a T statistic, right? So really it's still a test statistic, right? Before we were still finding test statistics. We called them Z statistics because they came from that Z table, that standard normal distribution. Here, I'm gonna call it a T statistic because it's coming from that student T distribution. Okay? You can almost think about it as you know, the general term is test statistic. And really all I'm doing here is saying, well, look, if it comes from a standard normal distribution, we'll call it a Z stat. If it comes from a student T distribution, we'll call it a T stat. In fact, we're not gonna do these examples prior to the exam, but there's an F distribution that we can use for certain statistics as well. And then we would call those F stats, right? So we're really just identifying it is a test statistic, but what distribution is it coming from, right? But for us, we we'll won't have to worry about these two prior to the exam. Right? So we've got this T statistic that we'll now calculate. But really, other than that, it's the same, right? It still represents a test statistic. So we can still do this critical value approach, right? Or, or the p-value approach, right? So we could do, we want to do the p-value approach. It's still going to be the, I'm going to have to close that door. It's still going to be the same thing, except, except now, right, we see some sample mean. For a right-tailed test, my p-value, I'm still looking for the area to the right. For a critical value, it still looks the same. It's just that now, instead of coming from that standard normal distribution, we want to find the critical value that gives us alpha in this tail. Well, now our critical value isn't going to represent a z value. It's going to represent a t value that comes from that student t distribution because those test statistics that we've calculated are no longer going to be coming from a Z table or a standard normal distribution. They're going to be coming from a student T distribution. So it's really just kind of semantics and notation. It's still the same process. It's just when we go to the tables to look up a P value or a critical value, we don't go to that Z table anymore. We go to that student T table. Okay? So we'll get a little more practice using that today. All right. So let's work through an actual example here, right? And actually, before you go on, it looks like there's some serious work out there, so I'm going to show you this. All right, so let's say we want to test this hypothesis that the average home value in Muncie is something different than $90,000, right? So we take a sample of 51 homes recently sold. We find an average of $85,000, right? We also have a sample variance of, what, $100 million, right? Now notice when we're dealing with these large values, our sample variances end up being pretty large. So what would our known alternative hypothesis be? Well, we said anytime we see this word different than, we should be thinking about what type of tailed test? Two-tailed, right? Because different than is really just saying, is the true mean anything other than, is it not equal to this 90,000? So that's what we want to find. So we want to see, is it not equal to 90,000? So we assume the opposite is true as our null, which is that it's exactly equal to 90,000, okay? So we have this sample. We find a sample average of 85,000. So what this is gonna look like visually, right? We've got a two-tailed test here. I guess if we identify which one here. We're gonna be thinking about, we've got a two-tailed test. We know the distribution of our sample means should be around whatever that hypothesized true mean is which was 90,000, we found sample evidence or a sample mean that was 85,000, right? So that goes against the null, 
right? If we want to think about well, what's the p-value, it's the probability we saw evidence that went against the null that was as far away from the assumed true value as what we found, right? or anything further. But if I simply identify this as my p-value, why would that not be right? What would this area actually represent? Remember, what was our original test? It was a two-tailed test. So when I said that the p-value is the probability I saw sample evidence that went against the null, as much as you know, what I saw, well, it was equally as likely for me to have seen evidence over here that went against the null, right? Before, that wasn't true because I only had one tail test. But for a two tail test, it would have been equally as likely for me to see evidence that went against the null hypothesis on the other side. Right? But I only saw one sample, but I know that that's true. Okay? So this is not my p-value, this is only half my p-value, right? The other half is over here on the other side of the distribution. So if I can find this area, how can I find my total p-value? Well, if I multiply this by two, that would give me my p-value, right? Because I know that these are equally sized areas. So once I find one of them, to get the total p-value, I just multiply by two. Okay? So what are we gonna do? Well, we're gonna turn this into a test statistic where that test statistic is now a, coming from a student t distribution. So it's a t statistic or it represents a t value. However, once I do that, I can use my student t table. What's gonna be true about the sign of this t statistic or test statistic? Remember, t values, just like v, z values, still represent the number of standard deviations away from the assumed true mean. So if I see something below that assumed true mean, my test statistic, or my t statistic will have to be negative, right? I saw something below. It's a number of standard deviations below that assumed true mean, right? So once I look that up in my table, I can find this area. I know that I have, it was equally as likely for me to have seen something over here. So once I find that area, I multiply by two. Okay? Now it gets a little bit tricky with our student t tables, right? Because let's say, I, well, skip the critical values for a second. I wanna to get to where we calculate the test statistic, okay? So let's say I calculate this test statistic, right? It's negative 3.57. All I do there is I have that formula. It's the exact same formula I had before. It's just I plug in the sample variance instead of the population variance now. So if I get a test statistic of negative 3.57, you can kind of think about we found this was negative 3.57. I want to go to the student t table look up that value of negative 3.57 add degrees of freedom of what? Well, if my sample size is 51, remember degrees of freedom was just n minus one. So 51 minus one is 50. So let's pull up that student t table. I don't think I have it pulled up there. No, I have the z tables. So I look at this and I say, okay, well, my degrees of freedom is 50, so I gotta go all the way down to where my degrees of freedom is. 50, okay. Now, one of the issues is I only have six areas in the tail I can look up on the student T table, okay? So it's also only showing me, as a reminder at the top here, what's in the upper right tail. So if I'm dealing with kind of the left side of the distribution, I know it's gonna be all these same values, but negative. I could really like print this student T table off twice and just put negative signs in front of all of these and think about the second table that has the negative signs and instead would be the area in the lower left tail, right? But I can still use this to find the value and then just remember, oh yeah, if I've got a left tail test, it's that value, but for left tail test, my critical values and everything are gonna be negative. For right tail test, it'd all be positive, so I don't have to do anything here. For two tail test, I'll kind of have that same value, but pairs of critical values, right? One positive, one negative. So if I try to look up this test statistic at the degrees of freedom of 50, notice if I get a test statistic of negative 3.57, 
2.678, the area to the left of it would be 0 0.005, right? Because if the area to the right of positive 2.6, whatever it was, is, is 0 0.005, then I know the area to the left of negative 2.68 would be 0 0.005. So what that's really saying is, if I were to look up a test statistic of what, negative 2.68 something, the area to the left of that was 0 0.005. So what would the area to the left of negative 3.57 be? Even smaller, right? Even closer to zero. So I can't from the table get a specific p-value, but what I can say is I know that this area is less than 0 0.005. Yeah. So that was just, we have this formula for the test statistic and it's the same thing that we used when we knew the, uh, when we knew the population variance, right? That was our test statistic equation. It's just now instead of the population variance, we have the sample variance. And really what this is doing, it's the same thing as we were doing before. We're taking the statistic we're interested in, subtracting the assumed true value of that statistic, and then dividing by the standard deviation of that statistic, right? Standard deviation of our sample means, which would now be equal to the square root of the sample variance divided by the sample, sample size, because we no longer have the known population variance. Yep. Any other questions before we keep moving? I know this is tricky. We'll work through a couple of examples here. So all we can do is say that this area is less than 0 0.005. But remember, we have two areas, right? So if I know that each one is less than 0 0.005, what can I say about the total area in those tails? It has to be less than 0 0.01, right? Because this could be what? 0 0.0049999, and this could be 0 0.0049999. So if I add those up, it would be just less than 0 0.01. Or you can think about it as if I find kind of what this area is bounded by, what the total area will be bounded by is just this times two, right? You're still just multiplying that, that by two when you have a two-tailed test, okay? So here we could say that the total p-value is less than 0 0.01, right? And that was just taken, we knew that one of the tails was less than 0 0.005, so you multiply it by two, it has to be less than 0 0.01. So with that p-value, what levels can we reject at? We only reject if the p-value is less than alpha. Our typical alphas that we're looking at would be what? 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01. So if my p-value is less than 0 0.01, is that going to be less than 0.1? Yeah, but if it's less than 0 0.01, it has to be less than 0 0.1. So I can reject at the 10% significance level. Is it going to be less than 0 0.05? Well, if it's less than 0 0.01, it has to be less than 0 0.05. So we would reject at the 5% significance level. Is it going to be less than 0 0.01? Well, that's literally what I have written up there. So yes, so I can reject that the 1% significant level as well. So it gets a little bit tricky when we're doing this by hand for a student T table, because we can only usually ever bound where that p-value is at. The only way that I couldn't bound where that p-value is at is let's say, let me look at the value so I can give you one that would work. Um, so let's say, it's a good one. Let's say instead of this test statistic of negative 3.57, we found negative 2.009. So let's just for a second assume that when I turn that sample mean into a test statistic, oh, no, was it 2.019? Let's assume I found that. Right? So I go to my table, I look up negative 2.019. It wasn't 019, sorry. It was 2.009. Well, now that exact value is in my table at the degrees of freedom of 50. And I could say the area to the left of that is 0 0.025. But unless your test statistic is one of the values in this table, all you can do is bound that p-value, right? So it makes it a little bit trickier. Now, if we do this in Excel, right, I can get the exact value. 
right? So it becomes, Excel makes it, you know, I know becomes a lot more useful when we're, we're dealing with the, the student t-table because we're quite often not gonna find these exact test statistics, right? It's probably gonna be somewhere in between. And so we're only ever gonna be able to bound that p-value, okay? But one thing we can do with a student t-table that we don't need to rely on Excel is, let's say instead when I was setting this up, so I have this two-tailed test. Let's say I wanna find the critical values. So I wanna use the critical value approach. Okay? So if I wanna use the critical value approach, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna think about, first of all, if it's a two-tailed test, and I gave you this as a multiple choice answer, which of these do you know has to be the correct pairs of critical values at the one, five, and 10% level? What type of tailed test do we have? Two. So I know that my critical values, right? I have critical values, right? So I know that I'm gonna have one on the left, one on the right. So I know I have pairs at each one of these alphas, okay? Well, there's only one of these answers that actually shows me pairs of critical values. So I automatically know it's gonna be D, right? But how could I actually find those, right? So what, what we're thinking about is for a two-tailed test, we wanna find what critical values would give us a total of alpha in the tails, which would mean that in each tail, we would have alpha over two, okay? Well, if I know my sample size, my N here was 51, my degrees of freedom was just one minus that, so 50, I could go to my table, look at that degrees of freedom of 50, look at the area I want in the tail. So let's say the first one we do is, um, let's do the alpha of 0 0.01. So there would be what, 0 0.005 in each tail. So I go to my degrees of freedom of 50, I look up that 0 0.005. Now the student T tables always deal with the right side of the distribution. So they'll always tell me the positive value. But if it's a two-tailed test, I know I have two critical values that would just be that. One will be positive and one will be negative. So degrees of freedom of 50, the alpha we wanted was 0 0.01. So the area in each tail is 0 0.005. We go to those tables in a moment. <laughs> um, we want 0 0.005 in each of those tails. Degrees of freedom of 50. The value that would give us that is 2.678, right? So we just looked up the critical values at the 1% level, which would be positive and negative 2.678, okay? We could do the exact same thing for an alpha of 0 0.05, right? It's just, you know, it's gonna change the number, but it's the exact same process. We would divide alpha by two, 0 0.025 in each tail, we go to the, the T table, our degrees of freedom, still 50. Now we want 0 0.025 in each tail, 2.009, right? So here's my kind of rejection region for that 1% significance level. I could then kind of put you know, negative 2.009 and 2.009. Here's my rejection region for the 5% significance level. We, you know, we could, whatever alpha values we wanted. Right. And now it still works the same way. Right. I have my critical values. If I had used the critical value approach here, what's my rejection decision? Well, I didn't even put the 10% level up here. But if I plot my test statistic of negative 3.57, remember that's what we found it to be, I'm clearly in the rejection region. Remember, this was my critical value when alpha was 0 0.01, and here is when it was 0 0.05. So I can clearly reject at the 1% significance level. I clearly can reject at the 5% significance level, which is really saying I can reject with 99 and 95% confidence. I don't even have to check for an alpha of 0.1 because if I can reject with 99% confidence, can I reject it with 90% confidence? Yeah, if you can say something with 99% confidence, you sure as hell can say it with 90% confidence, right? So this is kind of, you know, you can see with the critical values, I'm always going to want these same benchmark alphas and those benchmark alpha values 
even for a two-tailed test, when we divide it by two, those are really the values that are up here as our column headings. So the critical value approach is, is something, you know, on the exam, I'm not gonna ask you, I'm not gonna push it as far as asking you to find p-values when you don't know this, the population variance, because it does get a little bit tricky with kind of having to put it in bounds and well, if it's less than 0 0.01, well, is it less than or equal to, you know, it, it gets kind of tricky. I'm not gonna kind of push it that far, but I would expect you to be able to look up critical values for this student t distribution. I mean, in practice, you would, could, you know, you're just gonna use Excel to find the p-value because why, why, why bound it when you have this program that'll tell you the exact value, but kind of knowing how to use this table to get really like several critical values is pretty useful. Okay, any questions on that? I know it's a little bit, a little bit different, a little bit tricky. Throws in kind of some wrinkles of, of what we're doing, but it's still the same general process. So we've got our critical values. We've kind of already talked about that and how we did them. I talked about our test statistic. Um, now, one thing, just looking at this, and what I'm gonna say is not completely true for small sample sizes, but probably any sample size over 30. If I think about this test statistic, what is this really telling me? Remember, a test statistic either represents, before it was representing a Z value to us, now it's representing a T value. But the interpretation of those things are still the number of standard deviations away from the assumed true mean that your sample evidence was. I'm 3.57 standard deviations away. If we think about the standard normal distribution, right, and we know that's gonna be a little bit different than student T, but remember, once we got to three standard deviations away, the area to the left of that is essentially zero, right? It's very, very small. Well, for these student T distributions, I said really any sample size over 30, notice if I'm three standard deviations away from that mean, well, the area to the kind of left or right, you know, depending if we're looking at a positive or negative value of test statistics of 2.7 is 0 0.005. So anything three standard deviations or more further, you're getting a, a p-value or a probability of seeing that or anything more extreme to be pretty close to zero. Like it's gonna be pretty small. And you know, even without going through the process, you know you're probably gonna be rejecting. Now, if I get to smaller sample sizes, you'll notice now some of my test statistics, especially with really small sample sizes, some of my test statistics start to get quite a bit above three. So then kind of all bets are off. You have to go through the whole process. But when we've got sample sizes over 30, seeing something three standard deviations away from what you assume to be true, it's pretty unlikely, which means what you assume to be true probably isn't true. So you're gonna be able to reject it. So that's kind of the general idea of what we're doing here. Like I said, just getting familiar with seeing, you know, working through these problems, we'll start to realize like, when I see test statistics that are over three, I, I know that my p-values are gonna be close to zero. And I know if I plot my test statistic against my conventional critical values, it's probably gonna be way in my rejection region. Any questions before we keep, move on to the next example there? So, let's go through one more example before we go to, to Excel here. Oh, did I skip? There it is. So let's say uh, we want to see whether or not the average birth weight is less than 3,287. 3, um, oh, wait, sorry. The birth weight of Indiana births is less than the national average of 3,287. So we sample 400 births, we find a sample mean of 3,132, and we have this sample variance, right? What's the known alternative? Well, if we're wanting to test for whether or not it's less than this national average, we're gonna say our alternative is what we're trying to test for. So that would be, is the true mean less than this national average of 3,287? We'll assume the opposite is true, which is that it's greater than or equal to that value. So we have a what type of tailed test here? We identify the type of test we have by the alternative hypothesis. So we have a less than sign. So we've got a less than or a left tail test. The only sample evidence that goes against the null, right? The null assumes it's greater than or equal to 3,027. So the only way we can reject that is if we see something to the left of 3,287, right? Because then that wouldn't support the null hypothesis. We in fact do see something to the left of that. 
but is it strong enough evidence, right? This is a pretty large variance. So, I mean, seeing something that's 150 grams away doesn't mean much if the variance is really large, right? That still might be a very likely sample mean we could see if the true population mean was that national average, okay? So what would the critical values be for the one, five, and 10% levels? So if we look at here once again, what, what's gonna be my answer? B, right, why? We had a left tail test. Left tail test, our critical values are all gonna be on that left side of my student T distribution. Well, my student T distribution still has a mean of zero. So if I'm thinking about a left tail test, all my critical values have to be negative. So I want the area of the alphas of 0 0.01, 0 0.05, and 0.1. Well, now it actually becomes a little bit easier. That's the area I want in my left tail. I don't have to divide anything by two. It's not a two-tail test. My degrees of freedom would be what, 399. So I could try to go to the student T table here. But I'm going to notice, once I get to degrees of freedom that are that large, these values are almost no different, especially the second decimal, they're no different than if it was a standard normal distribution. So I could use the standard normal distribution to approximate it, or if I had degrees of freedom of 399, choose the one that's closest to it, which is 500, gives me an area of 0 0.1, 0 0.05, and 0 0.01 in that tail. Now remember the student T distribution always shows us kind of that right tail. I'm dealing with the left. So it's gonna be these same values, but negative. So I go down here, it's gonna be about what? 2.33 to the second decimal, 1.65 to the second decimal and 1.28. So it's gonna just, you know, we're just grabbing those values from the table. now. On the exam or something, I'm not going to give you an example where you have a sample size of 400 and you're like, well, that's not one of the values on the table. I will give you a degrees of freedom that's exactly on the table, but that's the process you would use. Um, if you had anything greater than, we said, really 100, you really, to that second decimal, you could use the standard normal distribution to approximate it and you'd be fine, right? It'd be the same value out to that second decimal. That's kind of how we would do that. Now, when we look those values up, remember we had the positive values, but because we had a left tail test, we said it's these values, but negative. But yeah, like if this was an exam question, this would be an easy one, hopefully. As long as you identify it's a left tail test, only one of these makes sense, right? But you can actually look, up, look them up and see what they, they actually are. We kind of notice if we go to that last row, those would be the same values we find if we use a standard normal distribu distribution to approximate it, okay? Any question, questions on that before we keep going? That makes sense. Oops. So what would the test statistic be here? I mean, at, this, at this point, like I said, the test statistic equation is really the same thing we were using before. It's just we replaced the population variance with a sample variance. So once we figure out that's the formula we're using, and when I post those practice exams today, I'll put the formula sheet up as well. You'll have this formula in front of you. It's really just a matter of plugging our values in, right? We're given every single thing in this equation. Let's just get our, our values plugged in. We find a test statistic of negative 4.6. So, I mean, we think about our critical values here of, whoops, negative 2.33, negative 1.65, negative 1.29. If we plotted those, our test statistics gonna be way more extreme, or it's gonna be far into our rejection region, right? And so, similar, if we wanted to think about, well, what's the p-value, what would the area to the left of negative 4.6 be? Well, let's say we tried to look it up. We go to that student T table, once again, we'll use 500 because we had 399 or degrees of freedom, so that's pretty close. Well, if I had a test statistic of negative 2.586, the area to the left of it would be 0 0.005. So if I'm looking at a test statistic of like negative 4. Point whatever it was, 6, I'm going to be even closer to zero, right? I'm going to have a very small p-value. So this is going to be something for, we're going to be able to reject at every single level again, right? Because we got a really small p-value. Okay. Any other questions on this one? Um, so we're not going to do two, two population mean stuff. I want to show you how we do this in Excel, right? And I'll kind of draw this, this example. So let's go to this unknown population variance sheet in that hypothesis testing file, or you could use that, that blank file or the one that we worked off of last class. We didn't do anything on this sheet. 
So I'll zoom in, kind of show you, you can see things just a little bit more. Okay. So I've got this uh, data on the age that someone first tried an e-cigarette, which one of them in there was nine, which I was like, dear God. Um, but, but we've got the data, right? So that's, you know, I don't, maybe there's some issues in the collection of it, but I, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna trust the survey. So uh, I put in the sample size of 30. It's much larger than 30, but once again, just to kind of prove a point, similar to when we did this last class. So I'm gonna to try to test for whether or not the, the, eight, the mean age is anything different than 15 when someone tries a e-cig, okay? So I'm gonna do anything different than 15. Okay? So we've got a two-tailed test, okay? So I'm gonna to try to find first the sample mean, which is just use that average function. We'll go over here, use that whoop, age first tried, select the entire variable. We get about 14.2. So we found a value that's different than 15, but is it different enough, All right? We'll calculate the variance. Remember, we don't have a population variance here. All we can do is calculate a variance from the sample. So var.s, we'll select that variable. And then I gave you kind of the, let's say we were finding this from a sample of 30 first, and then we'll do it. Well, what if we actually took it from the actual sample well, here? That's just like 6,000, okay? So I've got my sample mean and my sample variance. Let's say I wanna do this test at the 99% confidence level. So my alpha is 0.01 here. Well, my test statistic equation, is just gonna be, take that sample mean, subtract the assumed true mean, we then divide it by the square root of, well now we no longer have a population variance, we only have a sample variance, and then I'm dividing by my sample size. Right? All I'm doing is using Excel to do the math for me there, and the formula I was using was this test statistic equation, right? I was just entering this into Excel but I'd already had calculated the sample mean variance and sample size, okay? Any questions there? Shouldn't be too bad. At this point, it should look very similar to the example we did last week with the popular, known population variance, right? It's just that we actually had to calculate the variance instead of just being given to us, really. So we've got our test statistic, all right? If I want the p-value, well, I'm assuming the, the true mean is 15, and I found a sample mean of 14.2. So Visually, what I'm thinking about now is I've got my sample mean distribution. It should be centered around the true population mean, which I've assumed is 15. I found sample evidence. It's about 14.2. So my p-value would be the probability I saw something that far away from the assumed true mean or something even more that went against that assumed true value or something that went against it even more. So kind of this is my p-value. But remember, it's a two-tailed test, so it would have been equally as likely for me to see something this far away from the assumed true mean that went against that assumption or that null hypothesis on the other side. So 15.8. So I can find this area in Excel. I just have to remember, once I find it, I have to multiply it by two to get my total p-value. Okay? So how do I use Excel knowing my T value, right? Remember this test statistic now is a T value coming from the student T distribution. Well, if I know the value and I want to find the area to the left of it, I don't use the norm.s.dist function anymore. I use the t.dist. Okay? So I don't think we've used this one yet. We use the t.inv when we were building confidence intervals, but it's a similar idea. If I, instead, if I don't know the area in the tail, I instead know the T value, but I want to find that I do want to find the area in the tail. Instead of using norm.s.dist, I use the t.dist, right? Just use the student t distribution and it does the same thing. I tell it the t value. The one additional piece of information it needs now is, well, what student t distribution am I using? Remember, there's a different student t distribution at every degrees of freedom. So I say, well, it's my sample size minus one. The last thing we put, so comma, is a one, which just tells it, tell me the probability of seeing that t value or anything to the left at that degrees of freedom, okay? So this, I thought T value was to the right. So the table is set up that way. So this is a little bit, a little bit tricky, right? The table, I don't know, where is it? Is always looking at the right. Excel has the same kind of format for the normal distribution as it does for the student T. It wants you always to tell it the area to the left. 
Okay, that is a little bit of a trickier thing in Excel. It doesn't look at the area to the right. It always is looking at the area to the left. And, and really, the table should be set up that way in the, in the sense that when we're looking at cumulative probabilities, right, cumulative means look at this value and anything below it. And that's why Excel, we're always looking at the area to the left because it's treating it as like cumulative. It's integrating it from that, that T value all the way to negative infinity. It's a good question though. Any other questions there? So this should give us our P value, except what? Don't want to forget. Yeah, I did a two tailed test. So I need to multiply it by two. Now I get my P value, okay? I can do my rejection decision the same way as last class. I can use that if statement and say, if my P value is less than alpha, right? comma, if it's true, if that is in case, if that is in fact the case, put the word reject, comma, if it's not true, put fail to reject. Okay. Also, I, last section, they're a little bit behind you guys, but I, I was showing them how to do this for the other examples and someone asked me, do you have to put it in all caps? Now, I was just doing that to make it easier to see. Like, I don't know why I was being so emphatic about it, but like you could, you can put whatever text you want in there, which is actually like fun. You can set up Excel examples to, uh, like, this is like the nerdiest thing ever. But when I was younger, you had the, like the TI-83s and stuff. And I, me and my friends in math class, instead of learning anything, would just sit and figure out how to, to program these uh, calculators. And like you would, could ask people questions and like they would put things in and would like return things that we should not have been saying to them. Um, but you can probably do the same thing in Excel if you really wanted to. So, uh, but yeah, you don't have to capitalize it. You, this is really just, you know, you want this to be displayed in the cell, okay? So this makes sense, right? Our p-value was not less than alpha, so we failed to reject, right? But now if we changed alpha, let's say I go 0 0.05. Now it shows me I should be rejecting. Right? So it's kind of nice thing about using that cell reference for alpha instead of like entering it in. Um, we could do the critical value approach as well. This one, we now know the area that we want in the tail and we want to find the T value that gives, it, gives us that, right? So visually, to get a critical value, we look at that student T distribution and we say, okay, what value would give us alpha in the tails? But remember, we have a two-tailed test so it's what critical values would give me alpha over two in each tail. Okay. So I know the area on the left tail I want is alpha over two. So instead of using the norm.s.inv, I use the t.inv. I tell it the probability or the area I want in the tail, which is alpha divided by two. I tell it my degrees of freedom, which is my sample size minus one. Okay. So this is really similar to what we did last class, just instead of norm.s.inv, we use t.inv, and we have to tell it our degrees of freedom. We didn't have to do that before. Now, this is going to always give me a negative value, right? Because just like you said, well, doesn't it use, no, 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 that was the table, the physical table. Excel is always looking at that lower left tail. So when you tell it alpha over two, it's looking for alpha over two in that lower left tail. So if we use our conventional alphas of 0 0.1, 0 0.05, 0 0.01, we're always going to get a negative value, which is fine. And the way that I would set it up and the way you should, should set it up, it, I mean, if you're doing the, that, that Excel assignment for a two-tailed test, okay, use alpha over two to find the negative critical value. But for a two-tailed test, you know you have a pair, but you know that the other critical value is just the positive value that you found here. So just use that absolute value function, put it right next to it, kind of indicating we have two critical values here. Right? And that, that would be sufficient, okay? Any questions on this one? Now I'll show you something kind of tricky here. Let's say we wanted to do that if statement to figure out our rejection decision. And let's say I look at this and I'm like, okay, if my test statistic is more, right, if I'm thinking about this visually, once I find these critical values, I could say, okay, if my test statistic is 
less than this critical value, put reject. But wait, what if it wasn't less than that and it was right here? Well, that's not less than this critical value. It's greater than my other critical value. So how, what, how do I set this up if statement wise? Well, if I take the absolute value here, all these values essentially just become every value on this other side. So that's why I think I said this last week, which was, I shouldn't say I think, I know I said this last week. We might have forgotten when I said it. It was, it was a while ago. You can always just test if the absolute value of the test statistic is greater than the absolute value of your critical value, you reject, right? Because if I'm absolute value here, I reject. Absolute value is greater for my test statistic here, I reject. So what I'll do is say, if the absolute value of my test statistic right, is greater than the absolute value of, and I could choose either critical value here, it doesn't really matter because it's gonna take the absolute value so they'd be the same. If that holds, I know that my test statistic would be in my rejection region. So I would put reject, comma, if it doesn't hold, fail to reject, right? Here, let me move this over a little bit. So using that absolute value, make sure that regardless if you're doing a left, right, or two-tailed test, it'll always be the same, right? Now you could probably make this more complicated and do like a nested if, and if it's less than, or if it is less than zero, then check it if it's less than this critical value, if it's greater than, you know, but that's way more work than you need to do. Just look at the absolute value of that test statistic and the critical value. If the absolute value of the test statistic is greater than the absolute value of the critical value, you know that test statistic will be in your rejection region. Okay? And kind of the reasoning why behind that, right, your test statistic out here, the absolute value, once you take absolute values here, the absolute value of this is greater than that, or here absolute value doesn't change anything because they're already positive, the absolute value of your test statistic is greater than the absolute value of your critical value, you should reject. Right? So that's why you taking the absolute value works there. All right. So, um, so we failed to reject. Um, however, I gave you a fake sample size to kind of show you, if I only have a sample size of 30, seeing evidence that's kind of far away from that, I shouldn't say far away, it's, it's definitely inconsistent with that null hypothesis. We failed to reject, and my guess is we failed, you know, I think we can actually, we can reject at the 5% level, right? But we couldn't reject at that, whoops, 99% level. However, I didn't have a sample size of 30, which is that count function. I actually had a sample size of control shift or command shift down arrow, like 6,000 people. Notice when I have a sample size that's much larger, look at my test statistic here. It's negative 32. That means the sample evidence I found, even though it was the same sample mean, right? It was still only eight away from that assumed true mean. Because I took such a high sample size, Remember the distribution of my sample means goes down as I take higher sample sizes. So it was 32, that sample mean I found was 32 standard deviations away from that assumed true value because my sample size was so large. So it really allows me to kind of narrow down what re values I can reject. Notice here, I could probably actually reject something like 14.5. Yeah, I'm still negative 12 standard deviations away from it, right? I can actually say that I'm guessing this works. Yeah, I could even with seeing sample mean of 14.2, that would be enough evidence at such a high, if I had a sample size this high, which I do, to be able to reject that the true population mean when someone first tries e-cigarettes, I could tell you it's not 14.3. It's something different than that. And if I change this around, it probably makes more sense in this context. I could actually do like a left tail test and I can like narrow this down that I know it's less than 14.3 years old, right? Which, you know, I'm not a parent, but I imagine if I was, I'd be somewhat concerned about, right? So, um, you know, these are interesting things that we can do, especially once we get these huge survey data sets, right? Um, chance. Any other questions for me before we kind of end class here? Okay, um, we'll do some two population examples uh, next class. This should give you everything you need to get that, that homework assignment done, that Excel assignment. Uh, if you have any problems as you're working through that, I would try to work through that early so you're not working on it closer to the exam date. Get those questions out of the way early. 
Um, look for those practice exams. And I will get an online quiz up there today that'll have like two questions and that'll have to be submitted prior to next class, okay? All right, have a good day and I will see you on Wednesday.